Hey guys, welcome back to the channel where today we will be looking at this Olivetti PCS286 desktop PC. It's a little rough around the edges, literally, but it's a fine looking machine otherwise. Still has the Olivetti service number sticker. So in case of an emergency, please dial this number. So let's take a closer look. It's a very slim line form factor desktop PC with the Olivetti PCS286 branding and a three and a half inch disk drive. That's basically all you get with this PC. So on the front we have the Olivetti badge, PCS286. We have four bays it seems for three and a half inch devices. And we have the very recognizable Olivetti styling element here at the bottom of the PC. Moving to the back, we have a couple of ports. We have a printer port, an RS-232 port, which is basically a serial port. We have two PS2 ports, one for the keyboard and the mouse, a VGA connector and a power output connector. And the power input is just a wire hardwired here to the PC. On the left hand side we have the power switch and on the right hand side we have three slots here probably for ISA cards. Now before we can take a look inside we need to remove two screws here at the back and this will remove the back plate cover which goes off like this. And notice the nice little symbols marked here so that you don't get the ports mixed up. Now to open up the case, we're going to put it on its side like this. Remove four screws on the case cover and then it can just slide right on out like so. And here we go. We've got the case cover removed and now we can take a look inside. So we have a riser card with three expansion slots. We have the CPU, which is a 286. We have some memory expansion cards. We have some IO. We have some embedded memory on the board also, it seems. And we have the disk drive, hard drive and power supply unit. And let's take a look at that power supply unit because the uh, owner of the PC informed me that the PC does not turn on. So when he applies power and turns on the power switch, nothing happens. So let's take a peek inside the power supply to see what's going on here. Before we do that, I do want to issue this word of caution. Switching power supplies are connected to dangerous mains voltage. And the capacitors on the PCB can hold a charge with a dangerous voltage even when disconnected from the mains. So there is definitely a risk of electric shock, death, fire, explosion and all of the above. I also want to make clear that this video is not a professional instruction video. Do not attempt this at home without a qualified person sitting next to you. I also want to point out, if this isn't already clear, that I am not a trained professional. So please do not take my word for it. The reason I'm showing you this video is to just show you my train of thought, to get some discussion going and to show you how I got this computer up and running again. I am also going to be removing this cover here with the danger symbol on it. It seems to contain two chokes, something which is used for suppression of interference in switch mode power supplies. So here we have the power output. And just to show you the dangerous levels of voltage that we are dealing with here, let me hook up my multimeter to the power supply when it's turned on. So here you can see the voltage across the input capacitor is 336 volts and you don't want to get zapped with that. So if you're uncertain about working with these things please do not do them all the measurements that i have done here are done on a power supply which is turned off and disconnected from the mains voltage but please be aware that even when such a power supply is disconnected from mains it does have a bulk capacitor with a high voltage that can still hold a charge and can still have a lethal voltage applied to them 
and when you touch the leads bad things will happen even when the power supply is disconnected as can be seen here several seconds after having disconnected the power supply from mains there is still a dangerously high voltage across the two legs of this capacitor and it takes a very long time for it to completely discharge but now the first thing we want to do is check the fuse and although it's already visually apparent what happened let's do a continuity test so this should beep but it doesn't which means that the fuse has blown as you can already see so let's zoom in a little bit and when we pull the fuse out of the power supply we can see that it has exploded so you cannot see the wire anymore so it was a pretty violent explosion meaning that there was some kind of short in there so this is a one amp fuse so the current was definitely higher than one amp which caused this fuse to blow violently. And sure enough, with a new fuse installed, as soon as we hit the power, the fuse blows up. So we need to take a closer look. So let's continue with the disassembly of the system, starting with the riser board here, and also some screws on the side for the drive bay. First, we can remove the riser card, which has two 16-bit ISA slots and one 8-bit ISA slot. And on the other side, we also have two screws that we need to remove. And then we can take this whole assembly off, providing, of course, that we disconnect the floppy drive, the hard drive, and some cables here on the power supply unit, which is the mains coming in. The power supply is also connected to the main board of the PC, which is located underneath this assembly here. And it uses a proprietary Olivetti uh, connector. So it's not a standard AT power supply connector, which we'll look at in a bit. And here we have the entire assembly with the power supply unit, the hard drive and the disk drive. So let's remove a couple of screws to get the PCB from the power supply off of this assembly. There are a couple of screws that we need to remove. We'll disconnect the fan which is mounted here, which is actually blowing air onto the main board and is not used to cool the PSU. There are a couple of cables that we need to remove here. And then finally, we've freed up the power supply. So here you can see the proprietary main board connector. We have a standard Molex connector for the hard drive and a standard connector for the disk drive. Let's go ahead and remove the hard drive from this assembly. And this is a Connor CP3024, which is a 20 megabyte IDE hard drive. So these Olivetti computers and a lot of early computers only support a limited amount of different hard drive types. And Connor was especially popular in those early 90s models. And here we have a standard three and a half inch disk drive. So let's get some uh, air compressor going on here and clean up some of the dust which has accumulated on the main board and especially also on the power supply. And here we have the power supply all cleaned up. So here we have the mains coming in. We have a fuse to protect the circuit in case of a short. This blue housing here contains a line interference suppression filter. Next up, we have two capacitor here, which are related to radio interference uh, suppression. So these are X2 class safety capacitors because they are hooked up to the mains voltage they are classified as x2 meaning that they will uh, sit between the line and the neutral they will fail short in case of a failure such as an over voltage which can result in the fuse to blow up and here we have another set of two capacitors these are class y2 these are uh, suppression capacitors and they sit between 
uh, not line and neutral, but they sit between line and ground. And these type of capacitors are designed to fail open in case of a failure so that your circuit will continue to work. You will lose the uh, filtering, the noise filtering capabilities of the capacitor, obviously, but it will not blow a fuse and it will not prevent your circuit from running. Next up is this little component here, which is a thermistor, which is a resistor that reacts to temperature. So initially at room temperature, this has a relatively high resistance, meaning that it will limit the current flowing through to the component and it will limit the current that the other components after this component will receive. For example, this bridge rectifier and the uh, bulk input capacitor here. So initially it has a high resistance, it limits the current, so the initial rush of current that would normally flow into these other components will be limited. And because current is flowing through the resistor, the temperature will rise, the resistance will lower, meaning that more current can go through. So the goal of this component is to limit that initial inrush of current to protect the components. Now this component can fail and it will usually fail open circuit. It's very rare that thermistors will go short circuit. So this is something that we can easily check using a multimeter. Next up is this little guy here, which is a bridge rectifier. So up until now we have always worked with AC voltage. So this is the AC voltage supplied by the mains and we need to convert that into DC voltage. And that's the goal of this bridge rectifier here, which is in essence a collection of four diodes that will rectify the signal and turn AC into DC. Now, as there are four diodes in this package and diodes are known to fail, this is also something that we can check using a multimeter as soon as we know the pinout of this housing, which is typically found in the data sheet of the component. So that's also something that we will check. Next up is the main input capacitor or the bulk capacitor as it's sometimes referred to, to further smooth the rectified voltage. And keep in mind that this capacitor can hold a charge up to 400 volts. So even when the power supply is turned down, and especially if the power supply is bad, and the power which is stored in this capacitor has nowhere to go because there are other faulty components further down the line, then this, comp this component can hold up a charge for a long time. So it's very important that you do not touch the leads of this capacitor even after the PSU has been shut down and you need to discharge this capacitor before continuing. And next up we have the power transistor which is used to turn on this transformer and it does so very rapidly. It switches back and forth between the on and off state very quickly. And that's being controlled by this control IC right here. So this one will turn on the base of the transistor which will in turn turn on the transformer's primary winding. Now so far we've only talked about the input stage of the switch mode power supply. So the mains voltage coming in, being rectified, fed into the transformer. But we haven't talked about the actual output section, which is responsible for providing the lower output voltages that the computer needs. So that's the DC voltage, the 12 volts, 5 volts, minus 12 volts that this power supply is capable of delivering. But as we have an issue with the fuse that is getting blown each time we turn on the power supply, my guess is that the problem will be in this input section. So let's zoom in on every component and do some checks. Now the first component after the fuse is this radio interference suppression capacitor pair. So we're gonna check them for shorts using my multimeters continuity test. So just hit the two leads and we see that there are no shorts. That's already a good thing. Now we can take our ESR meter, which is capable of analyzing and measuring the internal resistance of the capacitor. So here you can see it has measured the capacitance at almost one microfarad, which is in fact uh, double the uh, capacity of a single capacitor. But because there are two of them, it, it sees both of them in circuit. So when we pull them out of the circuit, 
we will see that our ESR meter isn't capable of measuring them. And that's because the ESR meter has a certain capacitance uh, range and one microfarad uh, is the minimum that this thing can measure. So this will give a low capacitance warning so it's not able to measure the capacitor properly. Now let's look at this main input capacitor also sometimes referred to as bulk capacitor or smoothing capacitor. So this has a very uh, high voltage 400 volts as it takes the rectified DC voltage and stores the energy. So let's take a look with our ESR meter to see what the readings are on this capacitor. So I'm going to hook it up to the two leads. I get an ESR reading of 0 0.56 ohms, which is good, but I also get this in circuit leaky message. And if I do a continuity test, I see that there is continuity between these two legs. Now this is not good because obviously this means that the capacitor is shorted which is very odd because normally these types of capacitors don't go short circuit either they start leaking or they start bulging they go uh, open circuit but you hardly ever see these guys going short circuit so let's take it out of the circuit and do the measurement again so here i have the capacitor out of the circuit and let's hook up the esr meter again so we'll just connect the two probes to the two leads of the capacitor. It's analyzing. And now we see that it does measure the 100 microfarad capacitance and the ESR meeting. And it's not short circuit. So the problem is somewhere else in the circuit because as we probe the two leads right now without the capacitor in place, we still get the short circuit. So the problem is elsewhere. Now, next thing I wanted to look at is this power transistor which is used to switch the transformer on and off so the transformer that can be seen here is something that normally doesn't fail but this transistor which needs to handle large amounts of current and operates at a high voltage is known to fail now this is an npn transistor meaning that it has a base collector and emitter so it's very easy to check for shorts on this transistor just by doing some measurements on the individual leads. Now, when I take my multimeter and check the resistance between the collector and the emitter, I am getting a short, which is not good. And I see the same between the base and the collector. And on the base and the emitter, same thing. So chances are that there is an issue with this transistor. But to be absolutely sure, we need to remove it out of the circuit, meaning we need to remove it from its heatsink. So there is a heatsink attached to this uh, transistor because it can get very hot. And now we need to remove it from the PCB. So here we have the pads for the heatsink. We have the base, the emitter, and the collector. So let's just heat up the pads here of the three legs of the transistor and it should come right off. And now we can do a test using our multimeter. I'm going to set it in continuity mode. And as you can hear, all three legs are basically shorted. So there is definitely an issue with this transistor. So you need to get it out of circuit to be absolutely sure. And now we can verify that the input capacitor is no longer shorted. So the culprit here was definitely this power transistor. Now there can still be other issues with this PCB, but now let's focus on getting this power NPN transistor replaced with another one and see if we can make some progress. Now here I have another NPN power transistor taken from another switch mode power supply that I know that works. So if I do some measurements, I'm gonna put my multimeter in the diode function. And what I'll do now is check to see if there is a voltage drop between the collector and the emitter, which is the case here, 0 0.6 volts. And if I flip the leads around and check to see if there is a voltage drop between emitter and collector, I should get an over limit, which is also the case. And we can do the same test between the base and the collector. So in one direction, we should see the voltage drop, 0 0.5 volts, which is okay. And in the other direction, we again should see the over limit message. 
So this is a good transistor. We can do a similar test between the base and the collector. And we see the same behavior. So a voltage drop in one direction and an over limit in the other. So this seems to work. Now, because this transistor uses a different heatsink and it's firmly attached to the transistor, I need to remove the existing heatsink from the circuit as it's not really compatible. Now, when putting in a new transistor into this power supply, you need to ensure that it uses the same pinout. So we have the base collector emitter pinout here. And luckily, this NPN transistor uses the same pinout, although it is possible that these pinouts can differ between different models and manufacturers. So I'm just going to be bending the middle pin a little bit so that it will properly fit into the PCB. And then we can just insert it and see what she does. I am also going to be inserting the input capacitor back in here. And once everything is soldered back in, we can check for any shorts. So let's take the multimeter and do a continuity test. And as you can see here, the short is gone. But before we start testing, I wanted to show you one more component, which is this one, the bridge rectifier, which in essence is just four diodes. So in other power supplies, they might look like this, where you have just four diodes on the PCB. But on this one, they are in this special housing here where you can see the four diodes here on the diagram and it just exposes four pins. So it's a smaller form factor. You only need to have four pins on your PCB. And with this schematic representation, we can do the necessary checks of all the individual diodes to see if they work properly because a bridge rectifier like this is also known to fail in switch mode power supplies. So it's definitely worth checking out to see if ours still works. So the way that we do that is we take our multimeter and we put it in the diode function and we're just going to test every individual diode. So starting with this diode right here, which is between pin four and three. So we are just going to take our leads and check for a voltage drop between the two pins, which we see here. And in the other way around, we get the over limit, which is good. Next up is pin three and two where again we see the voltage drop on one side and the over limit on the other one. Next one is between pin four and pin one. Again, voltage drop is there and over limit the other way around. And the final one is between pin one and two, voltage drop on one end and over limit on the other. So the bridge rectifier is okay. Now in the output section, there are also lots of components that you can verify. For example, the capacitors that you see here are used to smooth out the output voltage. Now these can also be checked using an ESR meter. But again, when you test these things in circuit, you can sometimes get measurements that are a bit off. For example, here we see 17,000 microfarads, which is in fact the 4,700 microfarads you see here times three because there are three capacitors in circuit. So sometimes you need to get them out of circuit and do the measurement again to get proper readings. But again, here the capacitors check out fine. Um, diodes are other components that can be easily checked. Sometimes you get away with them uh, by checking them in circuit. For example, the two diodes that I'm going to be checking here when putting the multimeter into the diode function, you can see the voltage drop in one direction and the over limit in the other direction. Sometimes you can get false negatives as well. For example, this diode here appears to be conducting electricity in both directions. So when I switch the lead of the probes here, instead of an over limit, I get an actual voltage drop, which is definitely not good. But when removing the diode out of circuit by removing one leg, you see the actual voltage drop in one direction and the over limit in the other. So it's always best to get the components out of the circuit in order to get proper measurements. And obviously there are lots of other components on the output section that can still fail, like this Schatzky diode or this silicon controlled rectifier. But now the time has come to test the power supply. And when I flip the switch right now, the fuse doesn't blow. The 
power supply fan does kick in, but the output voltages aren't all that clean, so they're jumping around a little bit. Now, this can be related to the fact that there is currently no load attached to the power supply. And also, when you turn off the power supply, it takes a very long time for the voltages to drop down. Now, when I added a hard drive, I noticed that it had trouble turning on the power supply. So it probably needs specific loads across the different voltage lines in order for it to operate properly. But now I did decide to hook up the power supply to the main board, apply power and flip the switch. And lord and behold, the motherboard and power supply came to life. We heard the two beeps indicating that the motherboard has actually done something. And when we look at the output of the monitor, we get the CMOS time error, so something wrong with the real-time clock. But the PC does appear to be posting. We see lots of messages popping up, and then finally it enters some kind of CMOS setup screen where we can configure the date, the time, the hard drive, floppy drive, and all kinds of stuff. But I am going to be leaving it at that for part one of this video because this has already taken up too much time. So in part two, I will be looking at the hardware side of things and getting the PC up and running again, checking if the hard drive still works, if the floppy drive works and get the machine fully operational again. So I hope you guys will stick around for that. If you like this kind of videos, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button give it a thumbs up and I hope to see you guys in the next part where we get the PC fully operational again. Bye bye.